Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 465th episode, we have a bunch of news, including two new sauropods, got some dinosaur nests, and much more news, as well as Dinosaur of the Day, Paluta Titan. It's a sauropod fest. <laughs> it is. Even I'm doing sauropod news. <laughs> And I think even the fun fact is about sore pots, but I'm not sure because Sabrina's doing it. It sure is. (laughs) But before we get into all of that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for making our podcast a reality. And this week, we'd like to thank the Howard family, Sarasaurus Rex, Shane Kylosaurus, Professor Herrerasaurus, Resident Zeno, LIO, Histology Saurus, TRX Dinosaurs, Richard, and Dr. Eric Nefarious. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a dino at all and being part of our community. We very much appreciate you. So jumping into the news, I'm kicking it off with a new sauropod. This one was published in National Science Review by Feng Lu Han and others. And in it, they describe not only a new sauropodomorph dinosaur, but more accurately, three new adult slash subadult skeletons and five clutches of eggs. Nice. And in those clutches of eggs, there are six that have embryos inside. And that's why you get to kick off the news this week. (laughs) You gave me an exciting story. (laughs) (laughs) So whether or not this is a new species, it would be an amazing find. The new species is just sort of icing on the cake. Yeah, usually it's the other way around. The new species is the big news. Yeah. Yeah, the, I always think embryos are the most exciting thing when we find them. Yeah, and this one, I think there were headlines talking about leathery eggs. Yes, I'll get to that later, but there's a lot to talk about with the animals themselves before even getting into the eggs. Okay, go so, ahead. So <laughs> <laughs> they think the larger individuals are probably adults. They said subadults slash adults because they didn't do too much analysis of it. They went down quite a bit of detail in different areas on these dinosaurs. Usually when a new dinosaur is named... The first paper is just like, here are the bones we found. This is the shape of the bones. This is how it differs from other existing animals. And maybe they throw in something like its closest relative is this. And it was around at this time and maybe this size. But in this one, they looked into the embryos. They looked into the eggshells themselves. They went all sorts of different places with it. So it's quite a bit of information in what was actually a pretty quick paper. Mm Mm-hmm. So they do think those larger individuals are probably adults, and that's based on their fused vertebrae. They didn't do histology, obviously. I think that would be reasonable to do in a separate paper. Sure. But their skeletal very roughly puts them at about six to seven meters or approximately 20 feet long. That's not that big for a sauropod. It isn't, but these are actually early Jurassic sauropodomorphs. Ah. They're not true sauropods with the really long necks and the long tails. They're much shorter overall. They're not stretched out yet. Mm -hmm. And it's bipedal. The new dinosaur is named Chenlong Shouhu. And Chenlong is a Mandarin Chinese name. And the long part means dragon. They often use that for dinosaurs. And Chen, which is another name for the Guizhou province. Can you guess where it was found? China. In the Guizhou <laughs> province. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Guizhou is in southwestern China. It's much closer to Vietnam than it is to Beijing or northeastern China, where most of the recent dinosaur discoveries in China come from. And it's also much earlier in time than most of those discoveries. The species name, Shouhu, means guarding in Mandarin. And that's because the adults were found within about one to three meters of the eggs. So they're assuming that the adults were guarding them. Oh, that's nice. I was thinking, oh, it's a guarding dragon of this province in China, but (laughs) it's also guarding eggs. Yes. It's sort of similar to the good mother lizard, aka Myasaura, and essentially the exact opposite of Oviraptor, which was found next to eggs and then just assumed must be eating the eggs. Mm. In this case, they're being more optimistic about what it was doing near those eggs. (laughs) Also, there are embryos in it, and you can tell that they're the same species, which makes it more likely that they were related Mm -hmm. and protecting them than just happen to be trying to eat cannibalistically similar eggs to themselves. That would be quite a coincidence. Mm -hmm. So they picked one of the adults for the holotype, as you have to. Well, it doesn't have to be an adult, but you do have to pick one. Yes, that's true. Usually you pick an adult if you have both because there's a lot of things that change as they grow up. So it's better if you can pick one that's not in the middle of major changes. True. 
But in this case, the adult includes the front of the snout and the lower jaws, including basically all of its teeth. Hmm. There's also most of the back and tail vertebrae. Most of those two are articulated. So you have a really good idea about its length overall, although they didn't put in a length estimate. There's also a full leg, both feet, the hips, a full arm and hand. So basically the only parts that are missing are the neck and the back of the head. Nice. And a couple other bits and bobs. It's too bad about the neck, but still pretty good. Yes. It could be why they didn't do a length estimate too, because the neck, Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially at this point, started changing quite a bit in different sauropodomorphs. So there's a lot of variability there. The embryo, or one of the embryos, since they are contained within the egg, is essentially totally preserved. Yay. I mean, it's kind of sad when you think about it, but they do look cute. They do. And you get so much information from these little packaged, fossilized (laughs) containers. All of the embryos that they found were similar in size. So they think they may have used synchronous hatching where the first laid eggs don't start developing immediately. And that's basically so that they can all hatch at the same time. There are quite a few different benefits to that. For one, the parent isn't dealing with trying to incubate some eggs potentially while other babies are running around. Also, if they're doing a mass hatching and a parent isn't around, then they're, they sort of have a strength in numbers component to them. A fair number of animals do that today. They have this synchronous hatching strategy. And thanks to CT scanning, we can see basically the whole skeleton of the embryos without having to dig into it and maybe damage some of the fragile bones in there. Mm -hmm. It looks like the embryos were probably close to hatching because they were filling up most of the egg. Oh, although that makes it easier to see that it's the same species. It does. And it also means that the bones probably have more calcium in them, and that puts them in better shape for fossilization. Mm -hmm. Because really early embryos are obviously pretty squishy compared to the ones that are right about to hatch. You can also see the posture that they were in inside the egg. Mm. And as the authors put it, quote, they display a transitional pre-hatching posture between the crocodilians and living birds. The head is near the pole and the hind limbs are only partially crouched, end quote, mm. which is similar to Massospondylus, which we've talked about a fair amount in the past because that's one of the first sauropodomorphs where we had all these details about the embryos mm-hmm. and sort of how they change from quadrupedal to bipedal as they grow up and other interesting details. Also, the adult has very short forelimbs and was definitely bipedal. However, the baby has arms and legs that are both about the same length. So it was probably quadrupedal. Oh, okay. So it starts on four legs and then as they grow up, move to two. Yeah. Where have we heard that before? (laughs) Humans also, I think Massospondylus is one of them. I like the idea of little baby dinosaurs crawling around though. Yeah. Chenlong is from the early Jurassic, possibly from the earliest Jurassic, which would put it between about 190 and 200 million years ago. Its overall proportions are a lot like other early sauropodomorphs. You could think of Lufungosaurus or maybe Pladiosaurus. It's got that bipedal stance with fairly short arms, although nothing like later dinosaurs like Carnotaurus or Tyrannosaurus or anything, just compared to its legs, they're shorter. Mm. It has a longish neck, even though it's still a long way to go before looking something like a real long neck sauropod. It also looks like it's about a quarter of the way between a carnivorous bipedal dinosaur and a giant quadrupedal herbivore. (laughs) If you sort of take that trajectory, that's sort of how I think of the early sauropodomorphs. Mm -hmm. They still have a lot of traits that look like those early carnivorous dinosaurs, but you're seeing a lot of details, like the neck is getting a little longer, the head is getting boxier, the teeth are changing, all that kind of stuff, where it's starting to get more like a sauropod. But if you just glanced at it, you'd definitely, out of the corner of your eye, think theropod before you thought sauropod. Mm -hmm. Its closest relative might be Unanosaurus, which is from Yunnan, one province to the west of where Chen Long was found. And Unanosaurus was also an early Jurassic sauropodomorph, although they found a lot of details that are different, like like where the hole is in the jaw and, you know, Mm -hmm. different angles of hip bones and things like that. The most striking features to me of Chenlong, though, is that its snout is more pointed than most of its relatives. Interesting. Yeah, it gives it sort of a more triangular 
head than you typically see with a boxier head on a lot of other sauropodomorphs, mm-hmm. which makes the front of its head almost resemble a theropod when you first look at it. Mm. Adding to that is that this fossil in particular, the holotype, has its mouth closed and lots of close packed teeth that overlaps the lower jaw. Oh, interesting. In sort of a theropod looking <laughs> way. And some of the teeth even look pretty sharp, even though none of them have serrations. So that lack of serrations means it probably wasn't eating meat. Yeah. But from a distance, it's like, ooh, those teeth look kind of intense. Maybe that helped with some defense. (laughs) Maybe. Although, as we've talked about in other episodes, there's a decent chance that it had some covering over those teeth when it was alive. But if it looked a little theropod-like from a distance (laughs) with the body type and everything, that might have helped. It had pretty good claws on its hands, Mm -hmm. too. That probably helped. And it was also big, too, Mm because even though it's only around 20 feet long. That was pretty big for the early Jurassic. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of dinosaur eggs from the early Jurassic to compare Chenlong from. We don't really have a lot of eggs from the Jurassic at all. Most of the eggs that we have are from the Cretaceous because they're pretty fragile and they tend to deteriorate faster than some of the other fossils. But Chenlong had pretty big eggs for an early sauropodomorph. They were 11.5 by 9.4 centimeters on average, and that's about four and a half by 3.7 inches, which doesn't sound huge. They're definitely much bigger dinosaur eggs in the fossil record, but they're big for their group. Mm -hmm. They were closer to the size of later sauropod eggs than they are to its relatives like Massospondylus and Musaurus. But like you were saying, its eggs are a little bit different than what we typically think of with dinosaur eggs. Ooh, we're getting to the leathery part. Yeah. (laughs) So usually we think of eggs as having hard shells. They're often over a millimeter thick, but not all dinosaurs had hard shelled eggs. Some of them had these so-called leathery eggs. They're not as thin as some eggs can get in the reptile family tree. Sometimes they can be basically papery. (laughs) Sometimes they're described as very soft or just soft shelled. But Chenlong did have eggs that were much thinner than typical hard shelled eggs which is one of the pieces of evidence that they may have been leathery in texture. Mm -hmm. Some of the other details is that the broken eggshell fragments are small, which is often the case for leathery eggs. Mm, Didn't realize. Yeah. The eggs also have a rough surface texture, and they're also irregular in shape, which gives them sort of a leathery look to them. Mm -hmm. And after a little bit more analysis, the authors propose that The earliest dinosaurs may have had softer, leathery eggs, and then over time, they evolved into hard-shelled eggs that we all think of. Interesting. That could be why we haven't found too many of these earlier eggs, then, if they tended to be on the softer side. Maybe it was harder to preserve. Yeah, it definitely doesn't help. So cool. Yeah, Chenlong is a really impressive find. Mm -hmm. Not only is it a new dinosaur, but there's three total adults. There's technically six embryos for a total of nine (laughs) individuals, and there's a good amount of both the adult and the embryo. It has a really interesting head. Yeah, very cool. Well, almost as cool, because it's also a sauropod, is a new titanosauriform, Garumba Titan moriensis. And this is the sauropod I promised to talk about a couple episodes back, and we got distracted by dinosaur teeth last week. This was published in Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society by Pedro Mocho and others, and it might be an early Sampospondylin titanosauriform. That's a clade that lived from the late Jurassic until the late Cretaceous, and they're known for having at least 15 neck vertebrae as one of their features. Now, as a sauropod, Garumba Titan would have had a long neck, a long tail, a small head, and walked on four legs. But with Garumba Titan, we mostly know about its foot bones and femur, which were distinct because it did not have a heel bone or a calcaneum. It had slender metatarsals, the foot bones, a reduced claw on the third toe, and no toe bones on its fifth digit. And its femur also had this well-developed bulge. The femur looks similar to later sauropods from the late Cretaceous. But Garumba Titan lived in the early Cretaceous, about 122 million years ago, in what is now Castello, Spain, in the Arcias de Morea Formation. The fossils were excavated in 2005 and 2008, and 
multiple partial skeletons have been found of different sizes, at least four individuals. Three of them are definitely from Garumba Titan. They picked the largest individual to be the holotype. That one had vertebrae that's more than three feet or one meter wide mm. and a femur up to six and a half feet or two meters long. Oh, man. That is way, way bigger than chin long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it also lived later. That's true. <laughs> its femur alone is probably taller than the entire dinosaur <laughs> chin long. <laughs> that's what I love about sauropodomorphs and sauropods. You get such a range. Mm-hmm. The holotype, they includes the neck and back vertebrae. There's tailbones, ribs, legs, ankle bone, most of the right foot. So I guess we do have way more than the foot and femur, but there's like distinct features in those. Not all the bones from the individuals have been prepared yet either. They did find two nearly complete articulated feet, which is pretty cool. At first, Garumba Titan was described as this indeterminate titanosaur form. This was in 2016 and 2017. But now it's got a name. The type species is Garumba Titan moriensis. And the genus name means Garumba Giant. It refers to Mola de la Garumba, which is one of the highest peaks in the area. This mountain. I think there's a hiking trail on it. And the fossils were found at the base of it. So that's how it got the name. The species name refers to the Arceus de Morea formation and the nearby town Morea where the fossils were found. A lot of sauropods have been found in this area, and Garumba Titan just helps show the diversity of dinosaurs in the early Cretaceous and what's now Europe. It also shows the complexity of how sauropods evolved, because you've got now European Cretaceous sauropods that are related to sauropods found in Asia, North America, and Africa. And it may mean that there were these periods of faunal dispersal between these continents where the sauropods, they're moving around. Hmm. Some other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Garumba Titan include Hypsilophodon, Iguanodon, we've got Spinosaurs and other Titanosauriforms, and other animals include turtles and plesiosaurs. So a lot happening. Sounds like a giant. Yeah. We got leathery eggs and giant sauropods. I thought you were going to say we've got everything from giant sauropods to little baby embryo <laughs> sauropods. That makes more sense. But the leathery eggs are just really standing out to me for whatever reason. <laughs> we will get into some polar dinosaurs in a bit. But first, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. Next up, there was a paper on dinosaur tracks in what's now Alaska. This was published in Historical Biology by Dustin Stewart and others, and it's open access. It's really cool because it's a coliseum of dinosaur tracks, and it sheds light on the diversity of dinosaurs that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alaska. There's a coliseum of dinosaurs in Alaska? Yes, apparently. What makes a a group of dinosaurs a coliseum? I think that there's so many tracks. Hmm. They found a lot of tracks. This is here in the Cantwell Formation in Denali National Park and Reserve in Alaska in the U.S. So late Cretaceous, it's about 70 million years ago. The Cantwell Formation is, quote, heavily folded and faulted, end quote, because tectonic plates have made the formation, as the authors put it, quote, steeply inclined and in some cases completely overturned. So that makes it really hard to do sedimentology and figure out what age stuff is. And It's hard for a lot of reasons because <laughs> it's a remote area and it covers a large area. So there's still a lot to learn about this formation. And you probably can only really do anything there like two or three months out of the year when it's not covered in snow and ice. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of issues. But it's really cool. It's this multi-layered rock formation with the Coliseum of Tracks. I should say, is a multi-layered rock formation about 217 feet or 66.3 meters tall. It's tilted at more than a 70 degree angle. They mapped the site using unmanned aerial vehicle assisted photogrammetry, drones. And the paper describes the largest track site, which is the largest in all of Alaska. It's an over 80,000 square foot or 7,500 square meter area, and it's known as the Coliseum. Hmm. This set of tracks was found in 2010. There's at least 
1,700 tracks on multiple surfaces. Some of them are trampled and hard to see, but some of them have these detailed skin impressions. Like You can see the shape of toes and texture of skin in them. Nice. Those are the best. Yeah. They think the tracks were made in soft mud, and it's possible they were made near a, like a watering hole on a large floodplain. Makes sense if there's 1,700 tracks that some of them would overlap. <laughs> yes. be remarkable if none of them did. <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of weird. <laughs> So these dinosaurs, they lived at a paleo latitude of about 71 degrees north, which is higher than the current or modern latitude of 63.5 degrees north in the same spot. They would have lived in a place with a strong seasonal climate with a mean annual temperature of about 45 degrees Fahrenheit or about 7 degrees Celsius. And they would have had very long summer days and very long winter nights. Yeah. Well, they would have gone through those time periods because that's above the arctic circle where the sun doesn't set mm -hmm. in the summer and the time periods in the winter where the sun doesn't rise yeah i don't know how they did that that's intense <laughs> when you can't store food easily and you don't have electric lights <laughs> mm -hmm. but there's a lot of different dinosaur tracks there's ornithopods ceratopsids and small and large theropods both avian and non-avian oh yeah Avian small theropod tracks, that's very small. Mm. Bird prints. Yes. <laughs> also, a lot of plants have been found, including conifers and angiosperms. Those are the plants with flowers and seeds, and lots of ferns and horsetails, and invertebrates, including mollusks. So a lot going on here in these this harsh climate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clearly, it wasn't slowing any of these animals down. Mm-mm. The most common tracks they found were from ornithopods. The tracks are not equal in length and width, and they have these bluntly rounded tips for the toes and no hallux or first toe impression. So that's how you know it's an ornithopod. The ornithopods include Hadrosauropodus langstonii. There's these two weathered tracks that are found next to each other, probably from the same individual, as well as indeterminate Iguanodontipodidae. <laughs> That's a lot of syllables. Yes. <laughs> the Ceratopsian tracks, they know because there's five fingers and larger toes, and they include Ceratopsipes. These prints are broad, twice as broad as they are long. The theropod prints, they're narrow with a relatively long third digit on the foot and claw impressions. And the tracks include a new ichnotaxon. The track size means that the animal that made it probably had a hip height of a medium-sized tyrannosaurid, but it had relatively narrow digits, so it was probably more gracile or slender. There's also indeterminate tyrannosauropodidae, indeterminate dromaeopodidae, and bird tracks. And the heavily trampled surfaces they think likely means that the hadrosaurs and the ceratopsids traveled in herds. So lots of information you can learn from these ichnofossils. We see that a lot with these huge sets of tracks near water where they think it was a big group of animals traveling together and then they get all trampled by other animals and they think like another group of animals mm -hmm. <laughs> passed by later that's how you get up into the thousands of <laughs> tracks i think oh yeah and then if these animals keep going the same paths yeah that's true it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of different individuals it could be one individual retracing its steps over and over and over again mm -hmm. especially because they don't all have to be made within like hours it could be with made within days in some cases and still get preserved all as one yeah and you can't tell the difference of which day was which other than which came first based on <laughs> what's stepping on top of the other print yeah <laughs> so that leads me to the next item we have about polar dinosaurs but this kind of ties back into what you were talking about garrett because it has to do with dinosaur eggshells mm. This time, these are eggshells found in northeastern Russia, and they give clues as to how polar dinosaurs lived and reproduced. This was published by Romain Amiot and others in Diversity and is also open access. And dinosaurs we just talked about, they've been found in Alaska. They've also been found in northeastern Russia and Australia in high paleo latitude sites. So these places with these harsh climates and the, you know, days of darkness and days of only sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
The perinatal and young individuals have been found in Alaska, and then eggshell fragments found in Russia show that some dinosaurs, including some large ones, lived in the area, these polar areas, year-round. They were permanent residents of high latitudes, and they reproduced there. In this area of what's now Russia, the mean annual temperature was about 53 degrees Fahrenheit, or 12 degrees Celsius. The winters were dark and near freezing, and egg incubation may have lasted several months. So how did these dinosaurs that live in these near polar areas year-round, how did they live? How did they reproduce? Large dinosaurs would have been too large to brood, so they would have had to use plants to warm their nests, and they may have had to keep those nests warm for a few weeks up to six months, depending on the species. In the paper, they said that modern birds like the bald eagle or great horned owl or North American white-winged crossbill that live at high latitudes year-round either lay eggs in the middle of winter, so they hatch when plants start growing again, or they breed depending on the shift of seasons. In this case, the dinosaur eggshell fragments were found in the Kakanat Formation, so this was late Cretaceous in what's now northeastern Russia. They're from two oo families. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, how everything with eggs becomes ooh, mm -hmm. ooh species, ooh families. Yes. So there's the Spherolithidae, which is a hadrosaur, and Prismatulithidae, which is a theropod ooh family. And in the paper, they said this is, quote, one of the northernmost records of dinosaur reproductive behaviors, end quote. This is at a paleo latitude of about 75 degrees north. And it's a cool, quote, near polar climate where summer temperatures only average 20 degrees Celsius during the warmest month, end quote. That's about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's farther north, but it's also warmer yeah. than the Alaskan one. That's interesting. It is interesting. Still a tough place to live, it sounds mm -hmm. like. <laughs> For this study, they examined the oxygen and carbon isotope composition of eggshells, and they compared them to dinosaur teeth from the Koryak Uplad region of northeastern Russia, which is also a paleo latitude of about 75 degrees north. And they were able to figure out the environmental conditions and timing of egg laying. They could figure out how much water was ingested or an estimate and then compare it to the mean annual meteoric water estimates, how much water came from snow and rain, and the average local environmental water estimates. They studied also two hadrosaurid three ankylosaurid and two theropod teeth, as well as eggshell fragments from three spherolithid, or the hadrosaur, and two prismatolithid, or the theropod eggshell fragments, and three fish scales. And they found lower water values based on the oxygen composition of the eggshells, which means that it was winter water levels. Waters that females ingested while laying eggs and based on the isotopes could be related to melted snow that filled up local rivers and lakes. Also based on the carbon values, they figured they probably didn't eat much food before or while the eggshells were forming. So based on all this, they suggested that the dinosaurs probably laid eggs at the beginning of spring because winter would have been too cold and too dark with the darkness lasting two to three months and there would have been limited food. But the beginning of spring, the temperatures were mild and there was more food after the eggs hatched so they could grow large enough to survive the winter or possibly follow adults in migrating. Interesting. That sounds like based on their analysis, it could have maybe been at the end of the winter mm. because they're mostly saying that the water came from winter water. Oh, I see. But in the paper, they put it as beginning of spring. Yeah, just because it seems more reasonable based on how modern animals are. Yeah. Yeah, I always think it's interesting too with eggshells and really everything about embryo development has a lot more to do with the mother than it has to do with the baby. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like, what did the mother eat? What did the mother drink? Like that all gets preserved in the shell and even in the baby's bones mm -hmm. because the chemistry still all came from the mother. Whereas when you're thinking about older animals, it's like, what did that animal do? Yeah. <laughs> pretty cool that we can learn all of this stuff. Yeah. It reminds me too of the paleo thermometer where they look at the eggshell and see about what temperature it formed at. Mm -hmm. And that tells you the temperature of the mother's body <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when it's creating the egg. Back to the mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So that's polar dinosaurs and sauropods. 
We'll get into more sauropods in the dinosaur of the day, but I've got two quick updates, I guess. The first is that the Royal Tyrrell Museum now has the most complete Triceratops skull from Canada on display. It's known as Cali. It's nicknamed after Callum Creek, where the skull was found. And it's cool because Triceratops aren't usually found in Canada. But there were floods in Alberta almost 10 years ago that led to this discovery. It was found in 2014. It was found in different rock layers and the horn tips weren't well preserved, so they think it was buried in stages. They had to transport it via helicopter. It took a whole month to do in 2015. But it's very complete. You can see a lot of details. It took seven years to prepare this skull, over 6,500 hours. And they had to remove something like more than 1,800 pounds or 815 kilograms of rock. Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah, and meticulously for the most part, too. So you don't accidentally damage the fossil inside the rock. Yeah, but now it's the best preserved, most complete Triceratops from Canada. And it's part of the Fossils in Focus exhibit. I just pulled up a picture of it. It does look really good. Other than, like you said, it's missing those horn tips. Mm -hmm. And the way they display it, you can see all these cracks in its frill and everything. But that is probably the case with most of these ceratopsian frills usually they're just plastered back together yeah (laughs) so you can't see what it originally looked like i like it a lot when they show you more faithfully what it looked like when it was pulled out of the ground though Mm -hmm. Yeah, because at first when you were like it's the most complete triceratops found in canada they don't find that many in canada yeah you're wondering that doesn't seem that impressive (laughs) but it is (laughs) yeah it's good it set a high bar our last bit of news is that there's a juvenile t-rex nicknamed chomper that is for sale, and it's expecting to be sold for $20 million U.S. dollars. It's about 55% complete. The skull is more than 90% complete and includes a lot of teeth, hence the nickname Chompers. <laughs> the fossils were found in Montana in 2019 by Clayton Phipps, and it was featured on the show Dino Hunters. It took about three years to excavate. Chompers is going to be on sale at an art fair, Freeze Masters, London's David Aaron Gallery is presenting the skeleton at the fair, and they're pricing it at $20 million U.S. dollars. It's described as having strong bone color. I guess that's what happens when you're at an art fair. Yeah. <laughs> David Aaron Gallery has sold other dinosaur fossils before, including a Camptosaurus that went for $1.2 million U.S. dollars and a Triceratops skull for an undisclosed amount. Yeah, I don't think it's going to go for $20 million. I know last week, or maybe the week before, you were talking about a different dinosaur that was going for sale, and I was like, I don't think that's going to go for like $2 million. Mm -hmm. It was an herbivore. $20 million is a lot. Yes. Especially for a juvenile, because everyone wants the biggest, most impressive, largest teeth, all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. for their private collection. And this one, juveniles are really cool and more scientifically important, possibly, but for a private collector, I just, I don't see it happening. I guess uh, we'll see what happens. I hope it goes way cheaper and ends up in a museum instead. <laughs> I was just thinking like, yeah, maybe a museum can get it and it can get studied because I would love to hear more about a juvenile T-Rex. Mm-hmm. It's also interesting that they went with T-Rex and not Nano Tyrannus. Maybe there's more value in calling it a T-Rex. Mm. Or maybe they are on team T-Rex. Yeah. Or Nano Tyrannus is just a T-Rex. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, back to sauropods, (laughs) because this one is Paluta Titan. It was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It's a titanosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Romania, in the San Petru Formation. We mentioned it in episode 400 because it's a hot seg dinosaur, but we talked about a lot of dinosaurs, so now we're going to dive a little deeper into this one. As a titanosaur, Polluted Titan would have walked on four legs and had a long neck and a long tail. But some paleoart depicts it with a stout neck. Meaning wide and short? Or just wide, yeah. It's relatively small. It's estimated to be about 20 feet or 6 meters long and weighing 1.1 tons. Yeah, it's like roughly the same as Chen Long. It is. In some ways. <laughs> Except this one's a titanosaur in the late Cretaceous. So. And it's quadrupedal. Yeah. Yeah. They're both sauropodomorphs <laughs> around 20 feet long. <laughs> <laughs> 
Polutatitan fossils were found in 2002 during a Belgian-Romanian expedition. They found a partial skeleton in floodplain deposits, and at the time, it was the most complete sauropod found in Romania. Then it was named and described in 2010 by Zoltan Siski and others. The type species is Polutatitan nalitzensis. The genus name means marsh titan, and the species name refers to where the fossils were found. The holotype is a partial skeleton without a skull, and it includes vertebrae, part of the tail, part of the pelvis, part of the thigh bone, and two toe claws. At the time, it was thought it could be a specimen of Magyarosaurus, which is another titanosaur that lived around the same time and place, but they didn't have any shared distinguishing features, and the fossils were found in a different location. And there's unique features in details of the vertebrae, the neural spines, and the pelvis. So, Polutatitan became the second titanosaur described from the Hotseg Basin, after Magyarosaurus. Both Polutatitan and Magyarosaurus are lithostradians, which are derived titanosaurs that lived in the early to late Cretaceous. Many of them in the group had osteoderms, but not all of them. A 2022 study of titanosaur tails found that there may be four different sauropods in Hotseg Island, so Polutatitan, Magyarosaurus, as well as quote-unquote Magyarosaurus hungaricus, and an unnamed species. Some of the vertebrae indicated that there were medium-sized sauropods in the Hotseg Island, so they wouldn't be considered island dwarfs, which would show some more complexity in how these sauropods evolved, because Hotseg Island is known for the dwarf dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the biggest examples of like weird stuff happening on islands. Mm -hmm. There was a study in 2012 that examined some egg clutches from the hot seg basin. A lot of eggs going on in this episode. Mm -hmm. And they were found in the same formation as Polutatitan. They found 11 clutches of 40 eggs in total that were all thought to be from the same dinosaur species. The clutches averaged four eggs each that were nearly five inches or about 12 centimeters in diameter. But it doesn't sound like they had any embryos. No, it's unclear which species the eggs belong to. They just sort of assume maybe it's from this dinosaur because they're nearby. I don't think there's an assumption that it's Polutatitan. Okay. It's just unknown at this point. But it does show that the Hatzak Basin could be a major nesting site for dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous. For sure, for dinosaurs that were stuck on <laughs> Hatzak Island, they would probably nest on Hatzak Island. It also kind of shows how the smaller sauropods dealt with laying eggs because they averaged four eggs in each clutch, but hmm. other sauropod egg sites, they had about 15 eggs per clutch. Yeah, that's not very many. So yeah, not having too many eggs in one clutch might be part of that island effect or adapting to the smaller body size due to the island effect. Instead of laying smaller eggs, you just have fewer eggs. Could also mean that maybe they were doing more parental care. It's quite speculative. That is very maybe. speculative. <laughs> also, in the paper I was talking about with Chen Long, and they were saying that I didn't get into it, but they talked about the number of eggs per clutch. Mm -hmm. They ranged from something like four to 16. Oh. And they were saying, but we don't really know because there's always a problem of incomplete fossilization. Mm -hmm. So maybe the ones that had four eggs actually did have 16 or even 30, Ooh. but we only had four that were preserved. So that could be the case here, too. That's true. It's hard to say. Oh, the other reason they don't think it's Polutatitan is because the eggs and eggshells look similar to Nemectosaurid eggs that have been found in Patagonia, Argentina. So they think these eggs came from a Nemectosaurid. And Magyarosaurus is a Nemectosaurid. Hmm. They found these millimeter-sized embryonic integument. So there's a little bit. It wasn't... It's not that they found an embryo exactly because the embryo seems to have died before forming bones, mm. but it had this dermal papillae. So they had these dome-shaped features like the beginnings of osteoderms on a very small piece of skin, which looks similar to what we see in modern crocodilians at a similar age. And Magyarosaurus, in addition to being a nemectosaurid, is thought to have had osteoderms. Mm. <laughs> so there's no real embryo, but there's just like maybe traces of osteoderms. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It also seems weird that the osteoderms would form before the skeleton, but yeah. who knows? <laughs> who knows? And the fossilization process is weird. 
Some other animals that lived around the same time and place as polluted titan include, of course, Megiarosaurus, as well as the Hadrosaur Tomatosaurus, the Iguanodont Zelmoxes, the Notosaurid Struthiosaurus, and, of course, the apex predator of the time, the Pterosaur Hatsegopteryx. Yep. The weirdest thing of all. Yes. The pterosaur was dominating the dinosaurs. And we, yeah, we talked a lot about that pterosaur in episode 400. Yep. And now for our fun fact, keeping the sauropod train going. Sauropods had long necks and giraffes had short necks. I disagree. <laughs> I think they both have long necks. <laughs> well, take it up with Michael Taylor and Matthew Wadle because... They wrote a paper called Why Sauropods Have Long Necks and Why Giraffes Have Short Necks. <laughs> Weird. You're going to have to explain how giraffes have short necks. Okay, so I'll start with sauropod necks. Sauropod necks were longer than they needed to be if they needed to, say, reach the ground for drinking water. And as they put in the paper, quote, the necks of the sauropod dinosaurs were by far the longest of any animal, six times longer than that of the world record giraffe and five times longer than those of all other terrestrial animals, end quote. And some sauropod necks, as we've talked about on the show, were up to 49 feet or 15 meters long. Yeah, I think there were even some longer than that. Some amenchosaurus species that broke 50 feet, potentially. Mm. So how did that happen? Well, being big helps, but that's not the only factor. It also helps that sauropods walked on four legs because that helped with their large size and helped to keep them stable. And they had proportionally small heads with fewer teeth, so that kept their heads lighter, as well as a lot of neck vertebrae, like how one species of Mementosaurus had 19 neck bones. That doesn't explain everything, though, the vertebrae, because modern swans have apparently up to 25 neck vertebrae, which I didn't realize. (laughs) But with sauropods, the neck vertebrae were also long. And they had this air sac system, including the air sacs in the neck that helped keep the necks lighter. Theropods and pterosaurs, by the way, they also, we've talked about this before too, have been found with air sacs in the neck, but their necks were still much shorter than sauropods. Theropods seemed, quote, to have been best placed to evolve long necks, and indeed their necks probably surpassed those of giraffes, but 150 million years of evolution did not suffice for them to exceed a relatively modest 2.5 meters, end quote. That could be because they walked on two legs, they were bipedal, or, uh, you know, if they're not strictly herbivorous, they wouldn't have been under pressure to evolve long necks to get food. I mean, it could even be the opposite, because if you're dealing with struggling prey, Mm -hmm. you're trying to rip things. Well, they were talking about theropods like therizinosaurs. Oh, yeah, I see. (laughs) They also mentioned ostriches, but ostriches seem unlikely to evolve really long necks, quote, simply because they are small bipeds, end quote. So I think they're talking about like relatively. Proportionally speaking to the rest of the body. Yeah. Like you were saying with the giraffe, in terms of how it drinks water, Mm -hmm. it has to go way down and it might even have to sort of squat weirdly Mm because its neck isn't long enough. Whereas sauropods, it's like they barely have to angle their neck at all. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, pterosaurs also had log necks, probably because of their pneumaticity, but they were saying they probably wouldn't have evolved much longer necks because of size constraints for being able to fly. Interestingly, the best living animals to compare sauropods to are birds, according to the paper, because of certain features like having bony extensions on the vertebrae, pronounced cervical ribs, and the pneumaticities, the air sacs. The bony extensions and pronounced cervical ribs are features inherited also from a common Sorisian ancestor. So the cervical ribs may have been for inserting muscles. They might have also helped keep the neck stable. Some sauropods also had the bifurcated neck neural spines. They're forked. We also see this in some birds, like the ibis theristicus and ratites like the rhea. And these forked spines may have helped stabilize and support the neck. But not all sauropods had them, like most titanosaurs didn't. So in this paper, they found that you need a few features for a really long neck to work. Again, that includes being large, walking on all fours, having a proportionally small head, having a lot of neck vertebrae, and then having air sacs in the neck and ways to keep the neck stable. Now, according to the authors, giraffes have shorter necks because they have, quote, relatively small torsos, relatively large, heavy heads, only seven cervical or neck vertebrae, 
no air sac system, and no vertebral pneumaticity, end quote. So it's almost like you could say the giraffe's neck is limited to much shorter than a sauropod's neck is limited. Yes. Because of these different characteristics. Exactly. They did say, quote, in defense of giraffes, <laughs> they are relative latecomers in evolutionary terms. Given a few tens of million more years, it is conceivable that they might overcome some of these disadvantages to evolve longer necks, end quote. I was thinking the same thing too. Mm -hmm. Like they have seven neck vertebrae for now. Yep. <laughs> but lots of animals evolve more vertebrae later. <laughs> And the authors also note that all of this is known from incomplete remains. So, you know, there might be more to the story even. I just thought it was interesting thinking of giraffe necks as short. Mm -hmm. They are compared to sauropods. True. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy our show, then please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our show. Stay tuned next week. We will be talking about SVP News, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Yep. Annual conference. Mm -hmm. Lots of news always come out. We don't know what it'll be yet. Nope. <laughs> but we will all know soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. And until next time.